The second Harambe Prosperity Plan has been launched and encompasses economic recovery over the medium term. President Haki Kengup says the plan seeks to realign the country's focus to targeted interventions and accelerate development programs. A very good evening and a warm welcome to tonight's edition of Talk of the Nation. I'm Dean Vikisting and Penofina Aces is our sign language interpreter this evening. Now the second Harambe Prosperity Plan is a continuation of the first Harambe Plan but what exactly are the strategies of the first plan that we can build upon? Here to answer some of these and more pertinent questions are Ms. Inge Zamwani Kamwe, Presidential Advisor, Constitutional Affairs and Private Sector. Good evening, ma'am, and welcome to Talk of the Nation. Good evening, Denver. Thank you for having me. We're also joined this evening by Mr. James Nupe, Presidential Advisor on Economic Affairs. Good evening, sir, and welcome to Talk of the Nation. Good evening, Denver. It's always a pleasure to be in your company. Thanks for having us. Last but not least, Mr. Lamek Odada, who is a lecturer at the University, Namibia University of Science and Technology in Accounting, Economics and Finance. Good evening to you, sir, and welcome to Talk of the Nation. Good evening, and it's good to be back. Before we get into the deliberations and the conversation this evening, let's take a look at the following insert. Our apologies, we are experiencing technical glitches with the insert. We'll show it as soon as we are able to do that. Ma'am, let's please get right into the conversation. People-focused, business-focused, unlocking of new industries as well as job creation were key phrases that characterized the launch of the second Harambe Prosperity Plan last week. Talk to us about your impressions of the plan and the launch. Uh, thank you very much, Denver. Uh, Harambe Prosperity Plan 2 uh, is building on Harambe Prosperity 1. Uh, we have taken lessons from uh, HPP 1, and we have made sure that uh, under Harambe Prosperity Plan, we target on fewer, better activities that have got higher impact on employment creation and, and economic development. If you compare the two plans, uh, HPP1 had over 45 goals. This one has uh, 17 goals. The, the first one had over 176 activities. This one has 74. So we have learned a lot from the implementation of HPP1 and uh, the, the, the focus area, the pillars remain the same. We would like to build on the successes of HPP1. So it is indeed bold, it is people focus, and it is economic focus. It's, we hope that uh, with a new approach to implementation of HPP2, we can deliver the results that people are looking for. Very well. Speaking about th those lessons that we learned from the first plan, which are the key lessons that we did learn, and how do we plan to employ those to do better this time around? Well, one of the key lessons is that you need to be, in terms of your monitoring and evaluation of progress, you need to be more targeted and uh, more focused. So with HPP2, we have introduced the performance delivery unit, which will pull together the capacities and capabilities from all the various offices, ministries, and agencies into one unit under the presidency which will coordinate the implementation of the activities of HPP2. We have also, in collaboration with the OMAS, made sure that the activities, most of the activities that are in HPP2 are budgeted for and can take place within the next four years period, other than those that are dependent on uh, uh, public-private partnership and investment for implementation. Thank you very much for that comprehensive overview. Mr. Nupe, what is your take? No, absolutely. Denver, um, you know, when we speak about people focus, uh, we obviously take to heart and we, we, we are cognizant 
of the fact that the levels of unemployment are actually going to be quite elevated post this COVID pandemic. So all of the projects that we're going to be crafting and undertaking will have a specific focus on their employment capacity. And so even under the economic advancement pillar, we talk about um, taking impact, uh, impact, uh, employment impact assessments into account when we're rolling out these particular measures. Of course, when we talk about businesses, uh, we're talking about enabling businesses to survive through a very trying and testing time. And so this is why we'll be focusing on business rescue as a specific strategy to help businesses survive really testing times, uh, assist them to raise capital, and then hopefully they can come out the other side and hopefully keep some of their, their, their employees along the way. And then of course, we, we do realize that we do need to expand the mix of opportunities from the economy. So we can't just rely on mining and agriculture. We are going to try to introduce some new industries to attract FDI, as FDI has been on a declining trend really since 2015. Mm. And so those are some of the things that really stick out to me as we try to stoke the, the type of economic recovery that we need. Let's take a brief look at two of those aspects that you just raised at the moment. As far as business rescue as a goal is concerned, which are the activities that we are looking at in order to accomplish that goal? Absolutely. So um, specifically under the um, economic advancement pillar, we're going to be reviewing our insolvency legislation. Under the Companies Act, Chapter 14 would speak about winding up of companies and the processes that you have to follow. And typically, once you're uh, insolvent, uh, the, the process that follows typically requires you to identify all of your liabilities, so people that you owe money to, your creditors, and then the assets are frozen, and then typically the business is liquidated. So you sell all of your assets and you try and give back whatever money you have to, to those that you owe. Whereas with business rescue, we're learning from global best practice. It could very well be that there's an opportunity to put the business under curatorship. Uh, at that point in time, you allow the business to then try and solicit new sources of capital mm. to meet its obligation, and you basically get an overseer over the business during that process. And so that may allow the business to get new forms of capital, settle its liabilities, and actually come out the other side without necessarily having to fire all of its employees, liquidate all of its assets, and then start over again. So that's just one of the um, things, for example, that we'd be doing to, to really try and help businesses through a trying time. I think the other thing that we have uh, put in the, um, uh, in the economic advancement pillar is there is going to be a focus on procurement from the government, right? So to really encourage local procurement where possible, and then to try and look at something we're calling um, employment-centered budgeting. Mm. So as the government is, is putting resources behind its various activities, we're trying to ask them to try and rank the various activities based also on their employment capacity. Thank you. And so at HPP2, we will try and measure the number of jobs and uh, each activity to try and assist the government with that particular objective. Thank you very much, Mr. Odada. We've heard the in-house perspective. We'd like to gauge your take on this matter. Um, I think kissing the launch of the HPP is a clear indication that the Dr. Hage administration is really taking care of the Namibian people. And this has been able to take place even during the difficult times of the COVID. Remember, we've had COVID, we've got businesses losing businesses, we've got families losing employment. But here we now have a plan that is giving us a roadmap going forward. To me, it's a great achievement of the president, of course, with his hardworking advisors. It could have been easy to talk about it if there were no other circumstances. But look at what has happened during this COVID time. Mm. I think the president once again has done well and he has given us a roadmap. All we now need to do, read, understand, and at a later stage, we can now sit again, have a conversation and look at did we deliver A, B, and C? For now, it's just about let us read, let us understand, let us know what is in it for us that we can at a later stage come and monitor and Very evaluate. Well. So this is the second roadmap. And Mr. Mwani, come we touched on the lesson that we learned from the first one to use those as we implement the second roadmap. Which, according to you, are the key lessons that we did learn from the first experience? Again, from the first experience, I think HPP1 was a little bit over-ambitious. There were so many activities, there were so many objectives, but HPP2 now is a little bit more focused. 
And one of the key issues that came from HPP1 is the issue of monitoring and evaluation. Mm. I now see with HPP2, there are people who will be responsible for each activity that if we are going to be reviewing maybe after a year or two years time, we could ask the people specific questions to say, this was under your watch, can you give us an idea of why you did not complete it? So monitoring and evaluation is an issue that we learned from the first HPP and also just trying to be more focused, working with what we are able to achieve over the limited period of time. Thank you very much. Ma'am, Mr. Odara, that brings us to our next question. We do know that the number of pillars remains the same at five, but the goals, as you alluded to earlier, have been reduced. We have 18 goals and 74 accompanying activities. Bearing in mind, and according to him, the first plan was quite ambitious. Mm. Would you say that, as things stand for the second plan, that it's, isn't it still too ambitious? Yeah, thank you very much. We have a high level of confidence in the ability of various uh, stakeholders to implement these activities. Um, if you go to the back of the document, uh, the launch document, there are appendixes. In those appendixes outline all the activities, the timelines within which we expect them to be implemented, and also who is going to be responsible for implementation. At, with a performance delivery unit, we have now committed to do monthly uh, monitoring and to be able to issue reports to His Excellency, who will then in turn will give quarterly reports to the nation. So we'll be able to track real pro progress on time as activities are being implemented. And uh, if there are any problems that we pick up, we'll be able to obviously um, look at how we can assess the situation and, and change course. With, like all other plants, um, there are some unknowns, uh, the black swans as they call them. And if that happens in the, in the journey of our implementation, as it happened with the onset of COVID, which has interrupted a lot of activities uh, last year, and also stretch the resources of government, that's something else. But based on what we know now, based on available resources, and based on the uh, capacities that we have, and the plans we have, we should stand a highly good chance to implement these activities. A plan is just a plan. The actual implementation depends on the people. Mm -hmm. And like Odata say quite rightly, we need to read it, we need to unpack it, and we need to understand what it means for each and every one of us. Government can bring up plans, a roadmap with all the goals and activities, but if the people at the grassroots levels are not feeling the impact of those activities, then it remains just a plan. So it requires a full chain approach in terms of the implementation of the activities from central, national government through to regional, all the way down to local government, down to the constituency level. And part of the plan is, as the plan is now launched, we need to go and unpack and we need to work very closely with the implementing OMAS and stakeholders to say, this is your activity. Give us a plan of how you are going to roll it out. And if there are difficulties, how are we going to help you with those difficulties that you may anticipate? So we... It's dependent on human beings' ability to do mm. uh, what they are expected to do. And we do hope that uh, as people read and as they understand the plan, uh, ownership will come through. And with ownership, then as, uh, as a nation, we can move much further than we, 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 we think we can. We can go miles further. Very well. Mr. Nupe, economic advancement is your forte mm. as far as the, the, the pillars are concerned. And you mentioned earlier that one of, the, one of the goals is, of course, to accomplish a diversified economy. Mm. How do we plan to reach that? Yeah, that is, um, that is an extremely important um, uh, ambition that the president has for the, for the country. You see, when, when Namibia just relies on one or two sectors, if an exogenous shock limits the output of that particular sector, the whole company flounders. Mm. And so what we're looking at um, throughout actually HPP2 is how do we set up Namibia so that it has multiple engines of growth? I think the, the document actually speaks about developing complementary engines of growth. And so 
we have said that we will continue to focus on our key core strengths, making sure there's enough water for mining to take off, making sure that there's enough private sector know-how and capital infused into government agricultural assets for that to take off. But we're also going to start focusing on new areas that we think have really strong latent potential, such as renewables. Both wind and solar, for example, uh, you know, we've been told we have world-class resources there. And in fact, um, last week, we received our first commercial offer to partner with an international developer to develop some of these renewable resources to manufacture a new form of energy that uh, is going to be used by, by economies out there in, in the world. So as we're looking to build this economy, we're saying we want to strengthen the old, but we also want to create the new so that the economy doesn't rely on just any one particular sector. Mm. Um, of course, we know that agriculture is our largest employer, whereas mining is our largest driver of GDP. And so one of the other things we're going to be doing to try and diversify that economy is to focus on SMEs, to ensure that as we're building the larger sort of um, infrastructure projects, the roads, the desalination plant, the green schemes, the SMEs are very deliberately identified and then plugged into those uh, big uh, projects, whether they will be supplying pipes, screws, even just fed cooks, so that that trickle-down effect actually does happen. So, so all of that is a part of trying to diversify our economy from the key sort of uh, pillars that we rely on for growth. While you still have the floor, so other than strengthening the old, creating the new, mm. all of this needs to happen against the backdrop of economic recovery. Absolutely. Help us understand how that will work in practice. Absolutely. And I mean, that is such a good practical question. So one of the things we now have to, to realize as Namibia is the government does not have the fiscal space to do it all. Mm. So already, I think, in, in uh, the, the, the third goal, one of the key activities there is we're going to be developing what we're calling an integrated national financing framework. This, uh, the roadmap is actually a part of the Development Finance Assessment Report, which is a, a report that was generated by the National Planning Commission. And essentially what it entails is that the government will now need to start looking at a diverse source of capital to try and fund its projects. What does that mean practically? It means look at the assets that you have. Say, for example, you have a water asset here, desalination. And on this side, say you have, you're constructing a hospital. Then you can now look and say which private sector, local or international, would be interested in developing a desalination plant, for example. And in that case, you might identify ODA, official development assistance, on this side, or you might even build a green bond mm. where you will um, uh, list this particular bond on the NSX and raise capital from outside uh, Namibia, uh, especially once we've um, developed this central uh, security depository that we want to, to develop. So the idea really is to say, we shouldn't just look at our own pockets. There are many people around the world who have capital that would actually like to develop our assets. And then the last thing, Denver, as we're talking about trying to diversify our sources of capital, is a recognition that around the world at the moment, all of the governments and the central banks have lowered interest rates mm. to accommodate the recovery. And so, in fact, we can get much cheaper sources of funding outside where some of these countries are enjoying interest rates of zero or one percent, that even after you hedge for the forex risk, that capital is still cheaper than going to Mr. Shimi and saying, give me some of that $16 billion deficit to build this particular desalination plant. And you know, that, that activity will be coordinated by the NPC, but the, the Ministry of Finance will play a key role, and of course, so will the central bank. Thank you. If Mr. Odada were to say that those plans, those ambitions to diversify the economy are way too ambitious, mm. what would you say to that? I would say to Mr. Odada that um, he, he is absolutely right if he expects government to do all of the heavy lifting. Mm. But, you know, the way we look at HPP2 is this is a private invitation from the head of state to all Namibian citizens to partner in the development of these particular uh, opportunities. Let me give you a practical example. One of our banks here in Namibia, in fact, the local bank here, was the first bank to issue a green bond in 2018. Now that instrument, for example, specifically raised capital 
from investors who were interested in developing, say, renewable energy solar panels on a building. Mm. We can work, in fact, we've already begun working with that bank and the International Financial Corporation to try and develop a green bond, both for the private sector and the public sector. So if we try to do it alone as the Ministry of Finance or NPC or Central Bank, we would struggle. But if we start to partner with private sectors who are very passionate about the emancipation of our country, no matter the race, creed, or color, or gender, then the plan is not too ambitious. Thank and in you. fact, it's dynamic, and, and we should all uh, look, look out for it. Thank you very much. Mr. Dada, having heard Mr. Nupe explain how we can diversify um, the economy, do you think that plan is too ambitious? Um, I would start by saying that nothing is impossible. Mm. And like he says it rightly, we need every Namibian to be part of this process. Mm. But if we are going to leave it that no, this is a presidential affair or this is a Ministry of Finance affair, we will not succeed. Those plans need people from the grassroots. First, understand what the plan is all about. Such that when you are now have been given an assignment to execute, you know what you're executing. The major issues we have is that projects given when they go to the grassroots, nobody understands what they are supposed to do. Mm. And then all of a sudden, we want to start running back to the person who brought the plan. The person who brought the plan gave you an idea. But the person who needs to execute the plan is the person at the grassroots. So how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that the message also reaches the grassroots people in a way that they understand and can also ultimately take ownership of it? As May Inga rightly said, we do not end here. Mm. The plan... HPP2 has been launched. Now we go further. We go to the 14 regions. We work with the regional governors. We get people again, just like the consultation process started, the town hall meetings. People again should now have read the document, but maybe there's something they don't understand. Mm. We, should end, we should get out there, take the message to the people, give people a chance to question what is not right for them, get ideas from each and every person who wants to be part of the process, then we move as a team. Mr. Odada, at that juncture, I'd like us to take one slight step back. What we do know is that consultation is incredibly important. What is your view on how the consultation leg of the process actually went? If I remember correctly, and um, if my mind serves me right, I remember the president did the town hall visits in the 14 regions of Namibia. That process gave every Namibian a chance to go and give their idea or give their voice on what they wanted to do. Mm. And I remember very well, May Inge was part of the team that went there. I was once in Kitman's Swope and I had to attend one of them. So they did very well. And even with HPP2, I saw a series of consultations taking place. Mm. And this is what should be the right way. Let's get the people who are going to benefit from the project, give their views, let them air their, what they think is right or what should be done. And I also remember the other presidential advisor, Desiree, also had the youth involved. So they did very well in terms of consultation. And my hope is that we are all going to support the president in his plan to achieve what he calls the one Namibian house. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Mnupe. So, so Denver, just to contribute to that, we, I think that is such a critical point. How can people access this document? And there are a couple of things we're going to try to do different this time. For starters, um, HPP2 has a dedicated website. Um, and, you know, at the moment it's HPP, Roman numerals 2, so ii.gov.na. And when you go there now, you will see there's a landing page. It will detail out the pillars in a very succinct executive summary. But this document is a living document. And today is just but the start of a four-year journey. So as we go along, we will be uploading progress. Um, have we signed a deal? Has uh, the particular act been enacted? Has the sovereign wealth fund been seeded? Um, has that particular school in Onkurengava been completed? So... As we go along, we will be updating. I think the other thing we've done is we've said we want a very dedicated communication plan and we'll be putting together a rapid response team that will actually be engaging with the nation on social media, answering questions, why is this late and responding via the social media platform as well. 
And, and so with, with those two actions amongst others, we think that HPP2 will now be a much more responsive document. And then lastly, you know, personally, but I'm sure also all of our colleagues, we've all committed to, to do a lot less desktop research and a lot more on the ground visits. Mm. So for example, where exactly is the port of Angra in Luderitz anyway? I've never been there, but I know that we want to build it. So I'll come to NBC, grab a camera crew, and we should take the people of Namibia to Port Angra with a few developers who want to develop that particular port. Where is the Neckartal Green Scheme? Do the same thing. Um, you know, Vitfle, go there and look at the abattoir. So really to try and engage the people of Namibia and to make it extremely obvious, whether you're in the north, east, west or south, how is it that I can engage and touch the president's vision and be a part of a transformational journey over the next four years? Thank you very much. Um, Ma'am, um, Smipa just touched on proposed statutes and the purpose that they will serve. Now, we do know that seven pieces of legislation, including the Access to Information, the National Equitable Economic Empowerment Framework, NIEF, and the Remember Investment Promotion Act, are on the table to be enacted in order to uh, you know, support the activities but also create the much-needed environment. How soon do we expect those to happen? Um, uh, thank you, Denver. There are a lot more than those servants that have been highlighted. If you go through economic advancement, there will be two or three, and infrastructure development there will also be. So those ones were highlighted under the effective governance pillar. But uh, just to step back to say, HPP has been really one of the countrywide consulted documents. The inputs that are in that document come from nationwide consultation starting from 2019 with the town hall meetings and then from 2020 in July up to February this year. Series of consultations. So it is what it is. When it comes to the in for, in enactment of those pieces of legislation, if you go to the appendix on effective governance, again they will give you timelines. Most of them are already at an advanced um, uh, draft stage. They have gone through some of the process, including the Cabinet Committee on Legislation. So what needs to happen is that they come back to Cabinet for final endorsement before they are tabled in Parliament. So we are hoping that within the next, the end of the current financial year, which is um, 31st March 2022, most of those bills should have been passed by Parliament. But again, the process of parliamentary debate and tabling of those bills are outside of our control. But of course, we work very closely with the sector ministers uh, to monitor and ensure that uh, they remain on track. Thank you very much. Should you want to participate in tonight's very important conversation, if you have a question for one of the panelists, the number to dial is 61 291 0621-291-3339. Please, please remember to switch off your television set so that you avoid any confusion. Mr. Nupe, you earlier spoke about if we do accomplish diversifying the economy, we will also attract foreign direct investment. Is there a link between enacting some of these pieces of proposed legislation like NIEF and ultimate success of attracting FDI. Absolutely, there's a, there's a very big link. And you know, when you speak to, to local investors or local business people, um, you will see that there's definitely a tenable link. And, and there are really two pieces of legislation that, that we really need to get announced out of the way so that we know the rules of the game and, and so that we can deploy capital and take risks in an informed manner. NIF will be one of them. And the other one obviously will be the Namibian Investment Promotion Act. And both of those, the Namibian Investment Promotion and Development Board, uh, our new IPA that was in, in our investment uh, promotion agency that was set up under the presidency is instrumental in making sure that they, that they develop and, and they get announced soon. So the Investment Promotion Act will be looking to replace the Foreign Investment Act. And essentially it will look to lay the ground rules for how foreign investors can play and invest within the Namibian uh, sandpit, as, as it were. Of course, NIF looks to talk about how it is that we would be looking to try and empower previously disadvantaged people 
But not just that, it's actually also looking to encourage responsible corporate citizenry. And sometimes when I engage our business people in Namibia, I remind them that NIF is not so unique and so strange. In fact, in, in places around the world, I mean, in Germany, they, they were just passing legislation that was enacting and or encouraging a certain amount of female representation on boards. Of course, we all know about the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and many others. And so there's a global call for diversity and sustainability in the way in which it is that we deploy our capital. So even if you look at the ESG principles or the SDGs, the um, Sustainable Development Goals, they're all talking about harmony, inclusivity, and trying to interact with the economy and the um, nature in a way that is sustainable. So I don't think NIF is too different, um, but I have seen that a lot of work has been done with NIF and to, your, to, your, to use your word, a lot of consultation is going on and we really need NIF to come out you know, by the middle of this year so that we all know what the rules of the game are mm -hmm. and then of course participate uh, in a sustainable manner in, in Namibia. Bearing in mind how the process works in practice, and Ms. Samwanikam, we also referred to that we, are, to an extent, one doesn't have control over the debates in Parliament Absolutely. and how long that process will take. If we don't see those enacted this year, what mm. impact could it have? You know, really the impact it could have is, is an unthinkable one and we don't want to even spend too much time thinking about it. But mm. essentially what it will have is people just won't know the framework Mm. within which they are being asked to take risk. Mm. Because as you build businesses, as you deploy capital, you are taking a calculated risk and expecting an, a, a certain amount of return based on that risk. And you do that in a judicial uh, system, in an environment that is uh, guided by laws. So when those laws are not present or fuzzy, it makes it harder to deploy FDI. If you can't deploy FDI and local investment, it's harder to, to build businesses in a precarious environment where demand has been hurt and of course supply chains have been, have been disorganized. So essentially it will mean less money to employ people, less money to run businesses, less tax revenue obviously for our government. So I think it's certainly dawned on cabinet and all of government and, and hopefully the private sector that we have to do our best to get these pieces of legislation out this year and really get on with the business of building the, the, the economy from where we are. Thank you very much. Mm. 061 Mr. Odada, the concern many people have is not setting up the policy, but the implementation of the policy. How can we best fast track the implementation of um, the Arambe Prosperity Plan 2. Thank you. Um, the issue of putting up policies and implementing policies is something that we always have to keep on going back about it because it's the reality. Mm. There are so many nice documents gathering dust in offices, but nobody takes responsibility. Mm. And that's what Mayinge reiterated that in HPP2, they have now put up a unit that will deal with performance delivery. Mm. Performance delivery means this person will keep on knocking on your door, asking you, how far are you with that primary school that we are building in Opuo? Are we at the foundation level? Have we laid the foundation? What is missing? What can we add on to? And that also will require some commitment from people who are under that unit. Mm. Because at the end of the day, if those reports do not come, what then will the president report to the people when that quarter ends? Mm. So again, I'm happy to hear that there is a unit that will deal with performance delivery. Mm. What I would want to see, and I hope that's what the honorable uh, presidential advisors will help the president achieve, is to get the people under that unit to do their work. So that go out there. If somebody was given some work to do in Katima, can you go and check how far this is gone. Can they give you some evidence by telling you we can show you some pictures or something of that sort? So that is what I think could be the right thing. Very well. Mr. Nupe shared with us as far as his take on NIF is concerned. Amongst others, it also pursues responsible corporate citizenry. So I'd like to hear from you. How then does one build an economy that is inclusive and where growth and prosperity is shared? 
Remember, inclusivity has been the talk of the president. That is his philosophy, mm. inclusivity, where he says no one should be left out. And again, inclusivity is also not the responsibility of the president, but it should be the responsibility of the ordinary citizen. And this is where Mr. James says that we need to get those partnerships with the private sector. We need to reduce the inequality. We know Namibia is one of the most unequal countries in the world. So if we try to reduce those gaps, I think we should be able to get everybody involved and everybody should be able to get that slice of the cake. Even if the cake is, is small. Well, for the even moment. though the cake is small, <laughs> yeah. you Thank should you. be able to get a portion of it. Thank you very much. Ma'am, effective governance speaks to accountability as well as transparency and the strength, strengthening of national anti-corruption mechanisms. But we are always accused of not walking the talk as far as corruption or anti-corruption, if you wish, is concerned. Well, well, I think evidence suggests otherwise in terms of this government as far as corruption is concerned and fighting corruption. Firstly, you remember His Excellency when he took office in 2015. In December, the tender for the airport, for the expansion of the Hosea Kotako International Airport was almost awarded. When His Excellency looked at the pricing of that um, award of that contract compared to the initial estimates, mm. it was by two million more than it was initially, and he canceled it. That case went to court. The, initially, the contractor won in the High Court, His Excellency appealed, and the, the Supreme Court ruled in favor. So that's one example of how serious government is fighting corruption. When His Excellency also took office, he declared his asset voluntarily, him and the First Lady. Uh, they then introduced the Declaration of Assets and Interests, which is now part of the performance management system within government, where political office bearers, senior government officials, are expected to declare their assets to their uh, reporting authorities. A lot of things have happened. Today we have senior former ministers sitting in jail over alleged corruptions. And so it was also during this period when the first anti-national corruption strategy was developed and implemented with stakeholders across the nation. There is a national steering committee. An evaluation of that implementation progress was made. We are now busy developing the second anti-corruption mechanism. And I think if you also look at the transparency international in terms of perception of corruption in Namibia, then Namibia is also scoring well amongst the top five. So I think it's a question of what people would want to see is probably not what they see, and therefore they believe that government is not committed to fighting corruption. I don't think there has been any focus much more closely on corruption, and that is why it has now become known, and people know cases of corruption that we now have focus, targeted focus on, on fighting corruption. Thank you very much. So one of the commitment of HPP under the effective governance is to strengthen those institutions that are directly involved. That is the ACC, the Prosecutor General, the Namibian Police in terms of capacity and resources. Thank you. Also looking at making sure that the witness protection and uh, whistleblower protection mechanism are also strengthened. So there's absolutely commitment to fighting corruption. Thank you very much. This is only the first delivery of this conversation on this second plan. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Mr. Dada, what is the way forward from your perspective? Briefly. The way, the way forward from my perspective is that each and every Namibian, each and every one of us, let us get our hands dirty. Let us join the president in walking this walk. Let us give our effort all that we can afford to give and let us support what has been put before us. Thank you very much. Mr. Nupe, before you tell us whether or not from your perspective there is light at the end of this tunnel, mm -hmm. just very briefly tell us about the, the envisaged National SME Fund. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Denver. So HPP1 had um, three key aspects that they introduced that was really focusing on SME development. One was the Venture Capital Fund, the other was a Credit Guarantee Scheme, and the last was a Mentoring Fund. 
And these aspects were all really going to be championed under the Development Bank of Namibia and funded by MOF. What we're now going to be trying to do is, if you really look at the center of HPP2, the key theme is partnership. Mm. If we're going to get out of this, we're going to have to work with the private sector uh, and the public sector all, all together. And so with the SME Development Fund, we're going to try to be learning from regional best practice where we, we went and got private companies to contribute to a fund as a means to meet their enterprise development obligations under an empowerment legislation, so something like NIF. And if you contribute to this particular fund, you know, you would be uh, counted as a contributor to, um, uh, you know, enterprise development. And the government would then put the money in the same fund. This fund would then be managed by a professional or an entity that has a track record of developing SMEs, finding businesses, funding them, opening new markets to them, ETC. And we have such partners identified from the region who did this at a regional level and were then able to co-fund that particular uh, um, um, entity with money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as well as the USAID. So there was a track record there of being able to develop SMEs and to bring more money than just government. Thank you. We would love to replicate that particular model in Namibia. Thank you very much. So mm -hmm. notwithstanding the challenges that prevail, is there light at the end of the tunnel from your perspective? From my perspective, there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. And, mm -hmm. and that is because as we, throughout, as we were crafting this particular plan, the plan evolved and it evolved not with ideas just from people with government, it evolved with very specific private sector contributions that in fact have already been working. And so we, we are supporting their ideas and putting them on a platform at a national scale mm. with already momentum going. So some of these things you will see in the next few weeks, we'll start announcing a few wins and you'll wonder, geez, but they just launched them a few weeks ago. But in fact, we've been working on them with the private sector and international partners over the past five months. And so to me, that is what encourages me, is that people from all walks of life in Namibia are absolutely resolved to try and contribute to, to the forward movement of this country. And that excites me. And I think there's a, there's a certain amount of light at the end of the tunnel for sure. Thank you very much. Madam, you have the final word this evening. Thank you very much, Denmark. Certainly, there is a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. We need to pull together. We need to harambe. We're going from Thursday this week. We will already be back to NBC, the communication center, unpacking further uh, the various um, uh, pillars of Harambe. We are also hoping that we can get this translated into the local languages so that people at the grassroots can um, read and understand what is in it for them. Today we didn't speak about the social progression. The social progression is what touches the hearts of the people. That's where the bread and butter issues are. Mm. And of course, the infrastructure development. So, we will be out, we will be talking to the communities, we will be unpacking, and we look forward to engaging with everyone across the country. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for and having us. And doctor, thank you for keeping us accountable. Thank you. Yeah. There you have it, fellow Namibians. Remember that the second Harambe Prosperity Plan is the initiative of the head of state, but it belongs to the Namibian people. That concludes this edition of Talk of the Nation. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. Have a good and a safe week. Goodbye.